Dare to explore the paranormal with us at Paranormal M. Hit that subscribe button, drop a comment, turn on notifications, and stay informed about our latest eerie encounters. We invite you to join our community of truth seekers as we delve into the unknown together. Paranormal Encounter An Entity's Request for Permission For What? I want to share a paranormal experience I had in my grandparents' weekend house. A place I used to visit regularly and occasionally host gatherings with friends. On several occasions, both I and my friend have felt strange sensations in certain rooms, including discomfort and, at times, a sense of danger. Before the previously mentioned encounter, I had another minor experience that left a lasting impression. We were spending the night with friends. I decided to retire to a room for a nap. As I was about to drift off to sleep, I distinctly heard footsteps approaching my location, followed by the sensation of somebody sitting at the end of my bed. I was convinced my friends had come to my room. I could clearly feel someone's presence behind me. When I asked if they had been in my room, they all denied leaving their own. Then came the experience I mentioned in my previous story. While I was alone in the house, I decided to take a nap in one of the rooms that had previously felt unsettling. In a semi-dream state, I saw someone enter the room. This figure appeared to be a young person, and he sat down next to me without saying a word. The surprise came when I distinctly felt that this entity was asking me for permission. My response was a resounding denial. And since that moment, I have not experienced really anything out of the ordinary in the house, even when I've been alone again. These experiences have deeply intrigued me, and I wonder why the entity seemed to be seeking permission. And what did it want? At that moment, I felt that it was like permission to follow me. But I'm not convinced of this. Why did he need my permission anyways? Has anyone else had similar experiences or, well, any idea of what they could mean? Any advice or comments would be appreciated. Also, a few years ago I used a Ouija board with my friend in this house, but it didn't seem to move. Fair warning, listeners, I've had too much coffee. Dangerous and Unnatural Things Los Padres National Forest The 25th to the 26th, November 2022 Los Padres National Forest It had been so close for so long, but we'd never been there for whatever reason. Well, now was the time. The week leading up to the big day was filled with activity, hiking, movie nights, and cookouts. It all started on Sunday the 20th. Seth, Jake, and I went on a late-night hike to the hills above Ario Verde Park. The night was a veil of the unknown. The loop took us up a strenuous hill flanked by tall, dry grass. At the top, we got a nice view of the city, and something foreboding got a nice view of us. The way back was easier but the steep hills just betrayed our footing every other step. My shoes sent rocks flying like marbles in a home alone trap, and more than once I ended up sitting next to ants. When I reached flat land, we were greeted simultaneously by a chilly breeze and a chorus of low snarls flanking the path just beyond eyeshot. Initially, we dismissed the sounds as just some bobcats or coyotes. But we had actually stirred something from another place in time. And that something would come to find out had left the door open behind it. To celebrate, we had a carnasada in the backyard. 
We all went all out, and Jake grilled up some chicken, pork, and beef on the grill while I warmed up the large tortillas in a camping stove. On the side, we had salsa, sour cream, queso fresco, and it was hella good. The following night, Seth, Jake, and I took a trip to Scary Dairy for the first time. It was about a half an hour drive down there. On the dark roads, there were fewer and fewer cars until it was just us for miles. We made the initial turn to the entrance, but found it blocked. We debated whether to park here or to go inside, or if it would be safer to find a more discreet place to park before, you know, making the trip on foot. We turned off the car and sat inside for a minute while deciding. We were observing the traffic and possibility of being discovered was there. As the three of us sat in silence, peering out the windows into the darkness, we started to hear a humming. It was like a distant chorus of voices behind a church organ, but eerie and mournful like something out of an exorcism flick. Do you guys hear that? I asked. Yeah, what is that? Seth added. Thought I was hearing things. Sounds like some kind of hellion music, Jake commented. I leaned forward toward the windshield and squinted into the dense brush between us and Scary Dairy. Far off in the trees and vegetation, there was a loose circle of hooded figures carrying candles and lanterns. They slowly moved in unison through the forest as if gliding on the ground. Eventually, they faded out of view of the shadows and... Only specks of light remained, until those two faded. At that point, we knew we had to uncover the mystery of Scary Dairy. We decided to find a place to stash the car and make our way over by foot. The nearby housing tract was still mostly under construction. We found an open section of curb there, parked the car, before making our way over alongside the houses in various states of production. About halfway, the area became less and less developed. Street lights became sparse and then non-existent, and the occasional uninhabited house gave way to rows of empty dwellings. That's where we heard it. Some siren off in the distance was playing a message on repeat. Your trespassing. Police have been called. Leave the area immediately. You will be arrested. You are trespassing. We stood there for a second to analyze the noise. Is that for us or someone else? I asked. That's too far away. It's definitely for someone else, Seth replied. I don't know. That sounds pretty close. Maybe they see us with some kind of thermal camera, Jake suggested. Should we keep going or turn back? I asked. I think we should turn back if you guys want to keep going, I'll go too, said Jake. Let's just go for a little bit and see if it turns on again, Seth planned. We waited for the siren to stop emitting, then proceeded forward. We were on the same street as the entrance to the dairy now, getting closer to the point of no return. We waited for a clear break when no cars are coming, then crossed the street toward the entrance. On this side of the street, there were no sidewalks. We were in a sort of ditch filled with weeds. We heard the siren again, only this time louder and clearer. You are trespassing. Police have been called. Leave the area immediately. You will be arrested. This time, we decided to play it safe and head back. It wouldn't be our only chance to see the dairy and uncover the mystery. That night we had another huge barbecue in the backyard. We used a ton of charcoal and grilled up some chicken, drumsticks, and hot dogs. There were so many hot dogs that we couldn't finish them all, and there were still some more packs in the fridge to cook. On Wednesday the 23rd, the steaks ramped up once again. Seth and I returned to Scary Dairy during the day. This time the entrance gate was opened. We parked in the official parking lot. We found a dilapidated barn with most of the walls and roof missing, leaving only a rusty skeleton behind. As we stood in the center and surveyed the perimeter, 
The wind started to pick up. The breeze sailed through the structure and in between the railings in such a way that if you listened closely, you could hear faint distressed sounds of cattle being slaughtered. The entity that had latched onto us at Arayo Verde was now here, affecting the temporal field and stirring up living memories of the past. We made our way to the main structure of the dairy, a crumbling labyrinth of concrete and rebar with a single entrance hole cut into the perimeter fence. There were just rooms jutting off in chaotic directions, some of which were only accessible through broken holes in adjacent walls with no indication of a real designated entryway. Glass crunched beneath our shoes with each step, and the walls were caked in layers of graffiti. Finally, we reached the end of the structure. It was a large open-air courtyard with two long concrete troughs flanking the center. As we approached, a viscous black fluid started materializing in one end of the troughs and oozing down to a pool on the other side. Faint screams echoed in the chamber, increasing in volume as we got closer to this liquid. Something rustled in the bushes outside the perimeter fence, drawing our gaze for a second. A large black silhouette stood just outside as if observing us. It took a few steps closer and the silhouette faded from existence. I turned around to confirm that Seth saw it too, and at the same time I noticed that the trousers were once again empty, with no sign of the liquid ever being there. After snapping sufficient pictures we decided to head out. We knew that the answers couldn't be fully uncovered until we had a proper investigation at night. That Friday, the day of Los Padres had finally arrived. We packed the tent, the chairs, and the cooler. Since we'd been barbecuing so much, I rummaged through the fridge to find something easy to cook on a campfire. I found a rolled up half pack of Jumbo hot dogs, tossed it into the cooler with drinks. I was bringing the blanket that I had been using that week out to the car. That's when I was stopped by Seth. Don't bring that. We already brought a sleeping bag for you, Seth mentioned to go back inside. You did? Is it going to be warm enough? Yeah, it's brand new. We just got it for you. If you say so. Nick, Seth, and I headed over together and Gavin was going to meet us there. When we got there, the three of us immediately started setting up a tent. Not wanting to lose sunlight, we set off our first hike before Gavin arrived. The trail took us under a bridge, up rocky hills, across streams atop wobbly logs, and over large boulders. At one point, we saw a crudely constructed shelter made of sticks assembled in a cone shape with a low-hanging sturdy branch for support. What kind of creatures do you think lives here? I asked the others. Probably some type of witch or something, Seth replied. We should come here at night and catch it. That would not be a good idea, Nick replied hesitantly. We looked around the shelter and saw some discarded cans of food, animal bones of various sizes, and rocks painted with sigils from unknown languages. While we were inspecting the area, we got the feeling that we were being watched from somewhere nearby. We didn't stay too long. The wooded area opened up to a more dry, brush-type path made up of up-and-down slopes. Every few dozen meters, there is an offshoot in the path leading deeper into the bush on narrower, less defined trails. Seth wanted to go down each and every offshoot trail that we came across but Nick had reservations. Oh, new side quest. We have to see what's down this way, Seth said, pointing out a new path. Nah, let's not go down that way. We should stay in the path. Why? Is there something bad that you know of down there? Yes. When you go off that trail, you run into dangerous and unnatural things. Nick, you're just being paranoid. It'll be fine. Just come on. We went down the first side trail, getting all sorts of stickers in our socks along the way. When we reached a point where we couldn't go further without stepping through tumbleweeds and thorns, we stopped to admire the view before turning around. 
When we got back to the main trail, we heard voices and saw another group heading our same direction. We stopped before getting on the main trail and let them go first. One of them saw Seth's Boston Red Sox hat and asked, You really a Red Sox fan? Nah, it was a gift. Oh, all right. After they passed, we walked on the main trail some more. Took some more side trails to see if there was anything interesting. Each side trail just led out into weeds for a short distance before becoming unwalkable. Until we found one trail that went particularly far. This trail was flanked by tall shrubs and wound back and forth so that by the time we explored to the end of it, the view of the main trail was completely obstructed. When we were halfway back to the main trail, we heard voices approaching from the direction we came on the main loop. Is it that group with that guy that asked about your hat? I asked. Nah, couldn't be. They were ahead of us, and we never passed them, Seth noted. Wait, that's strange. One of them kind of sounds like you, Nick observed. Quick, get down, I said in a hushed tone, realizing that voices just... Voices. All of my power went out. Whoa, and my pedals are... Hold on. Realizing that voices distinctly mirrored each of ours, we watched from the bushes, trying not to move a single muscle. The voices grew louder until they were right in front of us. It was unmistakable. Exact copies of Nick, Seth, and myself were walking on the trail, having the exact conversation that we were having five minutes prior. That's us, but it can't be us, because we're right here, Nick pondered. Shh, just don't let him see us. We have to figure out what's going on and how to make it stop. The three of us exchanged worried looks. We waited until the alternate versions of ourselves trailed off. Then we waited some more. When we were sure that the coast was clear, we emerged from the bushes. We finished the trail and wound up back at the campground. After snaking through other campsites and clambering down and back up a ravine, we made it to our spot. To our surprise, we found a crackling fire with three weenies on top of it. Gavin had arrived while we were out and started cooking up dinner. Why are you cooking just three? Toss the whole pack on there, I suggested. That is the whole pack. That's all there was. No way. I grabbed the empty pack and sure enough, that is all that was in it. With three hot dogs and four people, somebody had to go without. I volunteered to make the sacrifice. We'll toss that pack of bacon on the grill and I'll have a bacon dog at least. We put the hot dog buns and bacon on the grill. Went to work chopping up a tree stump on our site for some extra wood. The fire was distributed unevenly so that one end of the buns and bacon was getting all of the heat. The other side was getting none. By the time all parts of the bacon appeared cooked, the parts that were nearest the flame were black as ink. The buns were no different. I picked up a few slices of bacon and slid them into a bun, making a crude hot dog homunculus. I convinced myself that it would be best to get over the worst part first so I could enjoy the rest. So I took a bite of the black end of the crude sandwich. Immediately my lungs were filled with the smell of ash and I began to choke. I had to spit out the contents in my mouth and then right off the remaining blackened half as a gift to the flame. The regular half of the food went in easy enough. It wasn't particularly appetizing, but food was food, and I knew that if I didn't eat what I could, I'd be regretting it later. After eating, we wasted no time in going out on a night hike. We went on the same trail as before, but started from the real starting point this time, as we had discovered that we previously skipped a bit by walking on the road. The start of the trail immediately led under a low-hanging concrete bridge. I was in the back of the group. I immediately, just upon leaving the road, I felt like we were being followed. I kept my pocket knife handy, just in case. The tall forest around us blocked out most natural light, so each tree, rock, or bush outside the direct line of our phone lights became a vague shape in the void. Almost immediately upon clearing the bridge, I noticed the group stopped. Wait, 
Was it up this hill or down this path? Seth asked from the front. Well, this path goes down across the stream. Where does that path up there lead? I think it leads to a dead end unless we're supposed to go over this tree trunk. I don't remember having to go over a tree trunk. Well, I don't remember having to cross the stream this early. It has to be up this way, Seth said, crunching piled leaves and twigs underfoot. The crunching got slower and slower until it stopped for a few seconds. What's going on up there? I asked. Okay, it's definitely ne not this way. Go back down, go back down, Seth directed. We doubled back and went down the hill, treading carefully so as not to fall into sharp rocks or spider-infested branches or the dark unknown of the stream. Eventually we started seeing familiar landmarks, including the branch teepee. We had pointed it out to Gavin from across the river. Damn, that's awesome, he said. Wait a minute. Something is moving over there. The branches on all the trees swayed, made a swishing, chattering sound. But there was no breeze. A hunched, gray, humanoid figure emerged from the trees near the teepee. It began going about chores near the teepee, moving rocks here to there and drawing things in the dirt with a stick. In the brief moments when the creature passed through the rays of moonlight, we could make out its striking features. Its face was that of a deceased old woman. It had tree branch like growths erupting from either sides of its head, and it had a long tongue that hung out of its mouth and dragged on the ground as it moved. What is that thing? Nick uttered in disbelief. The creature immediately dropped a bundle of twigs it was carrying and snapped its neck toward our direction as if it heard what he said. Even though it would have been impossible for human ears at that distance. Run! Run! We all took off sprinting. We ran for what felt like miles through the trees and the hills, and the whole time hearing the rapid thump, 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 thump of inhuman feet stomping behind us. A few rapid turns took the group out of its direct line of sight. Then we found a small rocky alcove to hide in. In the trees, we could hear the creature making hungry, frustrated wails that echoed through the woods. The wails started from behind us, then grew closer and closer until they were right beside us. We held our breath as slow, searching eyes scanned the foliage just outside the hideaway, before finally advancing on. In the darkness, we heard the creature's pained howls grow more and more distant before fading into the night. We took note of the situation, seized the peace to gather our spiraling thoughts. I think I know where we are. The three of us crossed this area on our first hike earlier. Seth scanned the terrain. I looked around and recognized it as well. I don't recognize this area at all. Nick glanced side to side. You've never been here before. Seth and I looked at each other. At that point, we knew exactly what had happened. At some point during the day, the version of Nick that had existed in our universe and the version of Nick that was from a time-jumped universe that we maybe encountered earlier that day had switched places. This also meant that the original Nick from our universe was now with the group of our parallel universe selves. We decided it was best to pretend that Nick was still in his proper universe and trusted our parallel universes to, well, do the same thing with their Nick. There was a tall rocky outcrop nearby. We climbed atop it to get a good view. From the top of the highest boulder we sat and watched the black forest blanket the mountains. The deep indigo sky above us acted as a street light that illuminated the long narrow freeway passing perpendicularly below us. We took turns scaring each other with the craziest doomsday scenarios that we could think of. Dude, imagine if you just heard howling at the top of the hill and the trees started splitting in a line coming toward us. Nah man, imagine if you just saw a siren head stand up on top of those mountains and it just started saying random numbers and words. Destroy, 17, 45, 6, consume. Every now and then a car passed on the freeway below us its lights temporarily blinding us before speeding away. We got a feeling for the time between, 
that we would first see the lights and when they would pass us. We saw a string of bright lights coming down the road. Get down, get down. As we were spies hiding from the guards, we were pretending. Only this time, the light didn't pass us in normal time. The beams were a crawl creeping along the tree line and inching over the rocks that we were perched atop. We cautiously raised our heads to see what kind of car was going so slow on an empty stretch of road. But it wasn't a car at all. We saw copies of the four of us in the road holding flashlights. They were wearing the same exact clothes as us and matched our appearances. Only each of them was covered in lacerations and various limbs were twisted in impossible ways. Almost like they had been mangled in a fatal car crash. The most unsettling part about these copies, however, was that they were staring right at us the whole time, smiling with wide open mouths. They never broke stride, continuing past us, twisting their necks like owls to continue gazing at us. Somehow our proximity to the witch-like creature earlier had infected us with some malignant force. The air was starting to catch a chill, so in the face of this new threat, we decided to head back to camp and try to sleep off whatever supernatural curse we'd contracted. We walked in the middle of the freeway, fearing what might be lurking for us in the trees. I clasped my pocket knife, my hand inside my pocket, ready at a moment's notice. We took a different route through a campsite back to our tent, which was supposed to be easier, but took us directly through a web-filled wall of bush. After sitting around the fire for a bit, the others started heading back. I burned off the last of the firewood and then used an empty can to ferry some water from the adjacent stream to douse the embers. I heard things splashing around in the stream each trip, but couldn't make out anything with my eyes. When it was finally time to go to bed, I unzipped the tent to an uncomfortable but all-too-expected surprise. As I had forewarned at the start of the trip, and every trip prior. The maximum space of the tent was greatly over-exaggerated by the manufacturer. Nick had inflated an air mattress in the center of the tent, which took up a good 35% of it. He was flanked by Gavin and Seth, each taking up 30% of the total space with their sleeping bags. In a small crevice between Nick's air mattress and Seth, I saw a smashed red sleeping bag. That must be my spot, I thought. I took off my shoes, stepped into the tent, immediately knowing something was wrong. I stepped onto the sleeping bag. It flattened like tissue paper. I could feel every pebble below it through my sock. I climbed in the sleeping bag, felt no difference in the temperature inside or out. It also pinned my limbs right up against my body, allowing for no movement. I would later come to find out that this was specifically a warm weather sleeping bag in child size that my dad had won for free at some event. I turned side to side throughout the night, shivering. I placed my jacket on top of the sleeping bag, spreading it out as pretty much over as much of my body as I could. But the uncovered areas were easily dissipating any amount of heat that it retained. I frequently sat up and checked the others to see if they were experiencing something similar but they were each clad in thick, real sleeping bags, so they were in a deep slumber. After hours of failed experimentation, I finally worked up the courage to check the car around 5 a.m. for something that I could use. I stepped out into the frosty air and opened the doors, searching for an additional jacket, blanket, or anything. In the trunk, I found my salvation in the form of an old discarded blanket of unknown origin. It wasn't particularly thick or warm, but it was enough. I brought it into the tent, folded it over onto itself to double the thickness. With that additional blanket, my body was finally warm enough to allow me to drift off to sleep. I woke a few hours later to the others already up. Gavin and Seth had been the first up, and they'd gone to the store to pick up breakfast, immediately after which Gavin had left. There was a plate already made up for me with sliced spam, hash browns, and eggs. I pushed it all off onto the camping stove for a quick reheat, and then went back to the plate that it went. It tasted amazing. As I savored each bite, I knew one thing for sure. 
Despite all the physical and mental scars that I'd accumulated thus far, I had survived. I had conquered Los Padres National Forest. Thought I was having a mental breakdown, but it was actually an entity. First off, I've always had something, specifically an ability to see, hear, or feel spiritual entities. It started when I was a young child, but as I grew older, the logical side of me took over and I didn't want to believe. I bought a home, lived there five years before selling. When I moved in, I felt a strange feeling, but I cast it aside. I did notice the following creepy things. 1. The door to the basement had a chain lock, which would prevent the door from being opened to the main floor from the basement. 2. There was an enclosed space under the basement stairs, and there were five unframed mirrors set up left by the former owners. It had a strange smell. 3. I was afraid of the basement. Not sure why, but I refused to go down there. My roommate did our laundry because I couldn't handle it. I would often hear footsteps at night, and when my boyfriend slept over, he said he would see my bedroom door opening and closing. Around October, I started getting a very strange feeling that I couldn't shake. I got to the point where I didn't want to go home alone. And it was getting harder to explain away the things that would happen. For instance, I'd put something away in the kitchen and it would end up back on the counter where I left it. And one time I was baking something. When I went to find my oven mitt, it was gone. I looked through the entire house, except the basement. <laughs> trying to logically explain where it could have ended up. Finally, after about 20 minutes of searching, I stood in the kitchen and loudly said, Where the fuck is it? I heard a sound behind me turned around, and there it was, sitting on the kitchen floor. From there, things intensified. I would feel the room get thick with another presence. I'm in my late 20s, didn't want to be a quote-unquote baby, but it was getting real. I literally thought maybe I was having some kind of mental breakdown. Real shit. One time I was so scared I called my grandma. She also has some kind of ability. And instantly as soon as she picked up the phone, there were no hellos. She said, worried, What's going on in your house? I asked why, and she said, because I hear a ton of voices. Are you having a party? Nope. Home alone. My back door started to vibrate, like open and shut really quick very slightly. And I basically left until my roommate got home. I decided I was going to sell the house. After I decided this, I started seeing what I perceived to be a toddler, a boy. He was very cheeky and wanted to have fun. In preparation to sell, I had to go down to the basement to clean. I went to one section and instantly felt a presence. It was an infant. However, it couldn't really communicate. I calmly said hello and asked how it had passed away. I instantly felt intense heat, as though a fire was burning. He ran upstairs, asked my boyfriend to come help me or at least be downstairs with me while I was cleaning. I went back down and in the same areas before where I felt the heat, I found a puppy toy I hadn't seen in years, as my dog was full grown. I bent to grab it, and I heard a voice clear as day say, Please leave the toy. At this point I figured I'd just see where all this took me and I said, Okay. I left the toy where it was. I turned around to grab the broom handle as I had been sweeping, and it flew away from my hand as somebody slapped it away. Instinctively I said out loud, Now that's not very nice. Boyfriend comes in and says, Who are you talking to? 
So I spill the beans that I've been seeing and hearing a little boy. Fast forward. My grandfather, an electrician, comes to look at my circuit board to clean it up before I list the house. He says, One of your dog toys is sitting at the bottom of the stairs. I didn't put it there. Dog doesn't go into the basement. Spirit was playing with it? Maybe. He says, uh, There used to be a kiln in here. I say, What? He says, there's a label here in the electrical panel marked kiln. Q full body chills. I felt fire and heat. Coincidence? The day I have my first showing, my dryer breaks. It's in the basement. By this point, I'm regularly talking out loud to this little boy. I tell him just because he breaks things doesn't mean I'm staying at the house. And to stop being naughty. Walk to my stairs to go down, and I kid you not, I feel a slight push and I fall down the stairs. I landed on my stomach at the bottom and slid across the laminate floor. I left the house and refused to go back unless I had somebody with me. Oddly enough, the house, in a desirable neighborhood, completely renovated and upgraded in a market where houses were going for like 80000 over asking, didn't sell right away. Most places at this time were selling in a day, not mine, and the feedback from prospective buyers, something didn't feel right. What? Weird. Finally it sold and the person who bought it gave me weird vibes. Really weird vibes. A house for $80,000. Where do you live? Please email me. I don't mind it being haunted. Virgin Mary I was lucky enough to have my great-grandparents be part of my life until I was in my 20s. I was very close with them. I was born to a teenager mother. So my grandma was only 37 when I was born, and my great-grandparents were in their 50s. My great-grandparents were very devoutly Catholic. It ended with them, though, and their children, and then my mother and me were never baptized or went to church. My family is super enmeshed. We visit each other multiple times a week, and we spent a lot of time at my great-grandparents' house when I was really, really, really little. Years later, I was told that they had a Virgin Mary statue that was about my height when I was like two or three years old. It stood in a corner in the floor in their house. They told me that I used to sit and talk to her. Lots of gibberish because I wasn't, you know, fully forming sentences or using a lot of words. They also said one time I got angry with her. I slapped her across the face and she broke. They would often try to teach me about Jesus and Catholicism after that, and I did go to church with them sometimes, because I knew it would make them happy. Interesting side fact, more for a laugh than anything. My name backwards is Ah Satan. Natasha. And I was born six weeks early and weighed six pounds, six ounces at birth. Childhood Encounters, Mysterious Figures, and Unexplained Phenomena I vividly recall an incident from my childhood when I was six years old. It was in our new house, which was a new build. At this time, my ma'am was very recently pregnant with my little sister. In the morning, as I sat up in bed with the hallway door open, I glimpsed a figure swiftly passing by. The figure resembled a Catholic nun in black and white habit. The image has stayed in my memory for years, and always when I remember it, I remember my ma'am's pregnancy as if the two were linked in some way. Strangely, never shared this experience, perhaps due to the sense that it wouldn't be believed. 
As a child, I always felt a presence accompanying me at night, persisting even when we moved to a different house. This feeling often got very overwhelming, prevented me from sleeping alone, and even when I was with someone that it was like something closing in on me and nothing could protect me. This feeling persisted through my childhood up until I would say I hit puberty, and it just kind of stopped. I think my parents always just put it down to being a scared child, but on reflection, I honestly don't think it was that. I honestly feel like it was a true sense of terror driven by something, something I can't really explain. In another incident around age 10, after we had relocated, I experienced small stones hitting my window while I played in my room. There was never anyone outside, and it's something which has always rattled my brain. Now, as I reflect on these encounters, I'm eager to share my story with the community. Have any of you experienced something similar? Or do you have insight into what these occurrences might mean? I'm open to your thoughts and interpretations. Ask Reddit. My mom used to be an RN at a hospital in a small western town. This hospital was connected to a senior living home, and at night, the RN overwatched both sides of the building, hospital and living home. She was usually the overnight RN, and would have either one or two CNAs working as well. She's experienced this apparition about six or seven times during her ten-year stint there, and everyone has referred to the apparition as the man in black. Each experience was identical except for the location in the building. Frequently throughout the night, she would have to do her rounds, checking vitals, etc., and would have to walk around a corner from the nurse's station slash ER toward the six beds in the hospital, and then towards the senior home. She would see the apparition either right after rounding the corner or right after walking out of a room and walking into the next. Outside of the next room, she would see the same apparition. The apparition was a person in a black, Old West-type suit with worn black cowboy boots and worn black cowboy hat to match. The creepiest thing about this man, assuming that his face was not very distinct, she would describe it as though a man's face was drawn with charcoal and slightly smeared, making it slightly blurred. He was maybe six foot five and would tower over her five foot five build. But whenever she would see him, whether it's ten feet or three feet away, he would stand there looking at her and then turn and walk into a room he was outside of. When she would walk into that room, there would not be any other person in there or anything out of place. The first few times scared her to a panic, but she slowly just went on without letting it freak her out. But with this man came some extra attention to the patient. The kicker was that in about 90% of all the experiences seen by other RNs as well, the patient's health would deteriorate in the next few days, and the patient most often passed away shortly after. So, whenever the overnight RN saw the man in black, extra precautions would be taken with that patient. Another weird thing about the apparition is that it's always seen by just the RN. Not a single CNA has personally seen the apparition. My mom always said that he knew who would be able to help the most at the time. I, on the other hand, took it as a completely opposite situation. I always thought that it was almost to mock the RNs because he would let them know that something was going to happen, but they could do nothing about it. Even though I'm not an RN to see him, it still creeps me out every time I walk down the halls and she points out where she's seen him. Ask Reddit we were raised by our grandparents. My earliest memories involve what my grandmother called the little white ghost. 
This ghost would turn lights off and on, walk the halls, flush the toilets, and move and hide objects that we would later find in the oddest places. The two scariest events happened one morning and then a different night. I was fixing breakfast early one morning before school. Thought I heard someone behind me. Thought it was one of my brothers sneaking up on me. It turned around real fast. I caught a glimpse of something. Light blue, maybe white. One of my brothers had PJs that color, so I set my breakfast aside and started chasing him upwards to his room. However, when I got upstairs, I realized everything was still, and he was asleep in his bed. I checked my brother, and he was really asleep. I had to go back downstairs by myself and finish getting ready for school. Had jitters all day. The second scariest, at least for me, happened one night after me and my brothers and grandmother were in bed. We kept hearing someone walking in the hall. My grandmother kept shouting for us to get into bed and quit fooling around. We all kept saying it wasn't us. This went on for at least an hour. Finally, I heard my grandfather's car pull into the garage and thought, Finally, now this will stop. I heard Granddaddy come into the entry, remove his work boots and walk to the kitchen, and I fell asleep. The next morning at breakfast, we were talking about what had happened the night before. I said I sure was glad when Granddaddy had gotten home. My grandmother just looked at me, told me that he had pretty much had to work a double shift, meaning he hadn't gotten home yet. Totally creepy. There are so many more stories from when my mom was young, but those were the two scariest things that I personally experienced. Things an atheist experienced and heard. What do you think about that? A bit of information first. I'm German, 40 plus, and a male. I'm an atheist and everything I'm describing allegedly took place in a small town until early 2000. It's right on the border with the former East Germany. Now, grab a drink, stay a while, and listen. A man from the neighborhood told that a small object landed in his garden. A few beings got out and took soil samples. The people he confided in told him to shut them up or they would come and get them. Unfortunately, I couldn't find out any more information except that this was in the late 60s or maybe early 70s. All of those involved are now deceased. I think, quote unquote, they meant the nice people from the asylum. Strange lights were apparently normal in my parents' teenage years. They called dates, looking at UFOs. As I said, our village was right on the border with the Eastern Bloc. It's not that unusual for someone to be interested in monitoring the border, whoever it was. My father saw a shining white woman in the stairwell of our apartment in the evening. He wanted to show her to my older brother, who was still small at the time but he couldn't see her. This probably happened in the 80s. There are thousands of reports about these women in white. Enough to fill several stadiums with the ladies. There are just as many interpretations of what these appearances mean, so I can't really speculate. It is remarkable that only my father saw the woman. It could be that only he could or should see her. Or he was drunk. I can no longer ask him about this because he died of cancer, 2001. In 1998, my brother and I were driving to my grandparents' house where he lived. From a distance, we saw what we thought was a helicopter hovering over the cemetery in our village. This is close to our destination. As we drove past it, we realized that it was one of those huge triangular UFOs that were often reported in the press in Europe in the 90s. We just drove past it without paying much attention. But we got to our grandparents' house, we got out of the car, and of course, it was gone. I've written about this before in another thread. 
even though the quote-unquote Belgian UFO wave was often reported in the early 90s. These things were also seen all over Europe before and after that. This was my only close encounter. I had seen one of these objects twice before, but this time it was close enough to kind of like throw a stone at it. But of course, we didn't. The most interesting thing here was not so much our lack of interest, that's another topic, but rather that this huge object, although it stood directly above the trees and had huge lights down its corners, it didn't illuminate the ground. How's that work? Was it amazing technology that utilizes features of reality that we can't even guess at? Was it some kind of hologram, a projection into space, or our minds? Secret American airplanes? Or are we just crazy? 99-2000 My father had been suffering from chest pains for days. He dreamed that at night he lay in bed. A gray alien entered the bedroom and placed its hand onto his chest. He felt better for a while after that. Maybe that's what happened. But it's also possible that he suffered more than he wanted to admit to my mother and us three children. It may have been like a subconscious desire for help that triggered this visit or this dream. A year later, my mother saw my father's deceased grandparents standing by his bed at night. They cried and said they had tried, but could no longer do anything for him, and he was later diagnosed with cancer, and like I said, died in early 2001. Again, it may be that this was a reality, but there's also the possibility that father told her about his dream, and this was part of her vision of the dream, or version, excuse me. Of course she knew more about his suffering than we children, who were more concerned with ourselves. Then there were a few smaller things that I can't say too much about. My brother felt his cat in his bed at night. Then it became clear to him that she would be in our grandparents' house. Or maybe a mysterious ball of light that flew through the bedroom. My mother said that when she left our parents' house and moved to another city that whatever she would do would stay there. Well, that's all for now. Nothing special has actually happened since then, which is kind of a shame. As I said, it all seems a bit thrown together and doesn't fit together well, but from all of this I conclude that such things happen much more often than you think, and or that many people ignore them. Keep in mind about them. Explain them away, maybe. Maybe they dismiss them as being unimportant. What has all of this done to me in my life and my view of the world? Actually, nothing. My family has always been open to everything and doesn't reject anything just because it can't be explained or is difficult to explain at the moment. There are a lot of things that are difficult to explain and understand. Black holes. How the theory of relativity and quantum theory fit together. Exactly how painkillers work. My toddler's thoughts. Maybe we, better apes, are just not able to see things as they are. My grandmother and I saw my grandfather the night before he died. This story happened 15 years ago, but I will always remember it like it was yesterday. My grandfather passed away when I was 12 years old. He was my father figure. My dad wasn't in the picture. My mother and I lived with him and my grandmother, so... It hit me real hard when he passed. The night after he died, I slept in my grandmother in his room to make sure that, you know, she wouldn't feel lonely. I was sleeping on his side of the bed, which was right next to their master bathroom. I remember waking up nauseous and immediately bolting for the toilet. As I'm in there, I faintly hear what sounded like someone dragging their bare feet on wooden floors. I looked into the bedroom. My grandmother's still asleep. I don't see anything out of the ordinary. I must be hearing things. I finish up in the bathroom and I'm about to head back to the bedroom when I remember. 
My grandfather dragged his feet when he walked. I don't think anything of it. I get back into bed. Just as I'm about to fall asleep, I heard the sound again. Feet dragging on the floor. Except this time it sounded like it was just a few feet away from me. I had a reaction, just looked in the direction of the sound, and there he is. He's standing in the doorway to the hallway with one hand on the door frame and the other on his heart. He was looking at me. When we made eye contact, he smiled. I smiled back, pulled the covers up over my head, and eventually went to sleep. The next morning when I woke up, I remembered what had happened and I told my mother. After hearing everything, she told me that I needed to tell my grandmother what had happened. So I do. Come to find out, she had seen him when I did. She had woken up as I was getting back into bed. And when she heard feet dragging on the floor, she looked and saw him standing there. She says they just smiled and stared at each other for a while before he waved, turning around and vanishing, walking down the hallway. Someone calls me at night. Even if it was a dream, the dream was so clear that it makes me doubt what's reality or dream. I'm pretty sure my eyes were fully open when I heard these noises. We moved in our new house in September. My room is on the ground floor. The rest of my family lives upstairs. The first encounter I had was during October. At midnight, suddenly, the dogs started barking very violently. We do have a lot of dogs around my house, and they do bark at night on a regular basis. But that night was different because they had an aggressive tone in the barking. If you're familiar with dogs, you can understand what I'm saying. Because of the barking, I woke up and was very angry. Because my room is on the ground floor, I could hear them barking very clearly. Suddenly, I heard like a toddler is calling me from outside my house. I was fully awake at the time and I could clearly hear the toddler calling me and the dogs barking in the background. I sat on my bed and heard the child call me. And then about a minute I went back to sleep. That time I was not very afraid but I was worried and a bit annoyed. I could just hear that the child's calling me not saying my name just babbling ah trying to catch my attention. In my mind, I was able to make a mental image of a child sitting on my front door stairs and screaming inside the house. A few weeks after this incident during November, suddenly I heard someone call my home and the name in the middle of the night. I didn't open my door because my mother had informed me not to open my room's door during the night, even if somebody knocks on the door, at least until I'm sure that it's my parents'. It's from a safety concern because I'm a girl living alone on the ground floor. This incident was not very clear, so I thought I just dreamt about it. But last night around 11 p.m. I heard my mother say my name and knock on my door. I could even hear the lock on my door move for a second. And then there was dead silence. I have a habit of not responding at night. And I wait for somebody to call my name twice or thrice before I respond. I was so sure that my mother's outside my room, so I got up and sat on my bed, waiting for her to knock again, but she didn't. After a few minutes, I knew some, or, well, I guess I knew nobody's outside, and now I'm starting to wonder if I actually heard my mother call me or if it was just a dream. But it's not the first time that it's happened, so now I'm a little concerned. Even if this is something that is calling me, I have a feeling that it can't enter my room or my home. In my village, they say that you need to include the entity, and they can't enter without permission, especially to one's home. I read knocking can be a sign of some spiritual meaning. Please help. My roommate and I don't know if it's paranormal or if it's in our heads. My roommate and I think we have ghosts in our apartment, but we're not sure. Sorry, if there's broken English, it's not my first language. 
So everything that happens, happens when each of us are alone. We haven't experienced anything like that when the both of us are together. We are believers, but still sometimes skeptics. The first thing happened to me. I was sitting in the kitchen by my roommate's bedroom door when she was basically going home to her family for the weekend. Sitting in the kitchen, I heard something like a chair move in her bedroom. I just stopped everything and I was listening. I tried to hear it again, but nothing. Mind you, this was just the day after we moved in. I like to think that it was just our neighbors upstairs, but still, not sure. Second, this happened to her. She was laying in her bed and heard a scream right next to her head. After that, she stopped everything she was doing and she listened. So she heard something like I was looking through my stuff in my bedroom. I was not in the apartment. And after moving stuff in my bedroom, she heard loud bangs on the wall between our rooms like somebody just hit the wall really hard from my room. Last, and the most scary thing for her, happened maybe two weeks ago. She just came from her singing class. She sings opera. She sat in the kitchen. She was singing something that she sang in her class, and right after she stopped, she heard someone like mimicking her voice. Sounded like her, but she didn't recognize the melody. She was intrigued and thought that someone is singing in the hallway. So she went to the door, and as she was going, the voice was moving away from her, and as soon as she stepped into her hallway, the voice stopped. She came to the door and just kept listening for an elevator or door closing. She didn't hear anything like that, so she doesn't know what it was, but definitely was very weird. We know that before this apartment was leased, here lived an old couple. The man died, I don't know when, where, or how, and the old lady's in her 90s and in a retirement home. Warning. Upcoming is going to be bad pronunciations, and even a bad accent. You've been warned. Ask Reddit. I'm a truckie mainly. Do all road train type work from Brisbane up around the top of Australia to Perth and along the Nullarbor. Seen some strange shit, but nothing like this, mate. Never really ventured into Vic in New South Wales due to scalies and revenue raising, but had to do an express run to Melbourne via Sydney. Had to come back up the Newell Highway to collect a load for Toowoomba. My boss said, I don't mind if you pull up before you get around Coonabara brand, as some drivers choose not to go through at night. With a giggle in his voice, by the way. I said, ah, she'll be right, mate. Plenty of hours left. All good. So I hooked in. Was in between Coonabara brand and Narabri, and a Sheila out of nowhere flagged me down, hitchhiking, looking to go home to her camp, and I thought, what the fuck is this shit? So I said, hop in. And the hair stood up all over my body with an instant. It was like I should have kept going. She stunk like nothing I smelled before and the cab was destroyed with stench. She didn't say a word and just gazed ahead. About 20 kilometers down the road and not passing one vehicle, the old woman said, Here, there it is. I had to stop in a gully and off she went with the bag. No thanks, nothing. I looked around but not a freaking thing in sight with no lights or tracks or anything. Glad she was gone, because my guts were almost ready to explode. Pulled up the other side of Narrabri for a few hours and decided to get going on daybreak, but had to sleep in the trailer because the smell was horrible. Woke up to another truckie kicking his tires doing a pre-start. And I climbed out, to which he replied, Fuck, mate, they're walking you pretty hard. I continued to explain the cabs absolutely stinking from the hitchhiker lady. He went pale white and told me exactly where it happened. I said, yeah, and he said, yeah. That nutter was ran over back in 1993 by a truck. I gulped and thought, fuck me. What the fuck's going on? Is this fucker for real? This was in 2014, and to this day, never been anywhere near that part of New South Wales. That princess is real for sure. I told the boss, and he laughed, and he said, there's coldies in the fridge, so hurry the fuck up. 
He showed me the camera in the truck, shows the passenger door open by itself and close by itself as if I'm looking across talking, but nothing on the video of her. Just thin air. An encounter I've never told anyone about. This is my first time actually telling people what happened, but this was a few years ago. But I'm going to give info on some things I've learned before telling what happened, so you get more of an understanding. My mom took me to see a medium in May. There's a medium and they told me that I had the ability to see those who have passed. And I'm also a medium, but I didn't know this when everything happened. Also, I've always been a believer of the paranormal and have been more in tune with things the rest of my family can't understand. Now that you have some info, I'm going to tell what happened. This all happened when my parents and I were staying at my grandparents' house. This was because we had to go to the Midwest for a funeral. The funeral was in Minnesota. My grandparents live in Kansas, so we had to drive to Minnesota and stay there for a few weeks because my great-grandma was in the hospital, and we all knew she was going to pass. I was close to her in a way, but... I never really knew her, but I took my first steps with her, and my mom tells me that, well, she was the first person beside my mom and dad that I would randomly hug and babble to. So to me, it felt like she had all the best parts and times of my life. But right before she passed, I'd gotten to the hospital and I was in a room talking to her, and I know it sounds weird, but I felt something so heavy in the room with me. It was hard for me to breathe, and it felt like it, like it wasn't there for me. She had passed while I was talking to her, saying that if she lets go, she wouldn't be in so much pain anymore, and would be with her husband who had died before I was born. The rest of that week still is a blur to me. All I remember was her funeral, but nothing else. When my parents and grandparents had gone back to my grandparents' house, I had to sleep in the living room, but that didn't bother me. But one night I was reading my book and my mom had just gone to bed. So I was the only one up and I wasn't tired, so I was reading to pass time. But I had heard someone call my name and that voice had sounded so familiar that I looked up when I had responded. I saw my great grandma right in the front door. But at the time I didn't really understand why she was there. I knew she had passed and her funeral was a week ago but I was just young and happy to see her. I had tried talking to her, and all she did was smile like how she would every time she saw me and my sister. I'd asked her to stay, but she said she couldn't and had to go. I remember sobbing so loud I woke up my mom, and I had asked to sleep with her and my dad, and when I woke up I went straight to my grandma to tell her what I saw. She told me that it wasn't her mother, and instead was a demon. Even now I'm so confused about what she said. I know that my grandma's Christian and follows the Bible word by word, but still, that was her mom. I have so many more things like this happening, but this one was one that stayed with me for the longest, and the one I wanted to tell, but after what my grandma had said stopped myself. But please let me know what you think, and if you want to hear more of these things that have happened to me. And if you want to hear more things, tune in tomorrow. See ya.